女士们、先生们，欢迎大家参加美国心理展望网络会议。今天会议部分演讲，我们提供字幕翻译；部分演讲，我们提供同声翻译。您可以在 Zoom 屏幕下方点击小地球图标，选择中文，就可以听到中文同声翻译了。会议结束后。我们还会和您分享今天会议的录制视频。女士们、先生们，虽然疫情阻隔了万水千山的旅行，虽然我们不能相互见面，但是我们可以借助网络继续和您保持联系。希望今天网络给力，保持顺畅。万一卡顿出现，请您多多包涵。今天的会议。有九位演讲嘉宾，他们发言的顺序是这样的：美国稻米协会总裁兼首席执行官 Basie Ward 女士致欢迎词，字幕翻译；美国稻米协会中国区顾问陈耀俊先生介绍美国稻米市场活动，字幕翻译；美陈陈先生会用中文为大家演讲。美国。农业部负责贸易和对外农业事业部副部长 Ted McKinney 先生专题分享“不同寻常的一年”字幕翻译。阿肯色州大学水稻推广农学家
Gerald Hardkey 博士谈2020年阿肯色州水稻种植和生产情况。字幕翻译：加州大学植物科学专业 Bruce Lindquist 博士谈2020年加利福尼亚州水稻种植和生产情况。字幕翻译：美国农业部农业经济学家 Nathan Charles 博士专题分享。2020年全球稻米展望，字幕翻译。美国动植物检验检疫局 Joshua Robinson 博士分享美国稻米准入细则，同声翻译。美国农业部北京农业事务办公室农业参赞 Bobby Rich 先生谈中美农业贸易，同声翻译。接下来是提问时间，也是同声翻译。最后，我们由美国稻米亚洲推广委员会主席 Chris Crutchfield 先生致闭幕词。好，谢谢大家。现在，我们的会议正式开始。Hello and greetings from the United States. I'm Betsy Ward. I'm the president and CEO of the USA Rice Federation. We are the national trade association in the United States for the entire rice industry. So we represent all of the farmers, all of the millers that mill the rice, the exporters, end users,、um, merchants, and、um, other other end users of rice. And we're really, really pleased that you could join us today to hear a little bit about. Our current U.S. crop, which is、um, just being finished up harvesting, and then how it could be useful to your business. So, here in the United States, we grow and export all types of rice: long grain, short grain, medium grain, parboiled, organic, wild rice,、uh, and have very many different varieties as well. Rice is grown in six of our 50 states, covering about a million hectares, and we export almost half of what we grow every year. And those. Exports go to many, many countries.、Uh, over 130 countries, from Japan to Saudi Arabia to Mexico,、um, and until very recently, we had not exported any rice to China. But、um, through our work with our colleagues at the U.S. Department of Agriculture、um, and others in the U.S. government, we've we've been working on this for almost 10 years、um, to try to gain access to the China market,、uh, and we have we have been successful with that.、Uh, we've we've Overcome all the barriers、uh, to to entry for U.S. rice, so we're really really excited to be able to share with you、um, our our rice profile and what we do in the industry here, and hopefully see some rice trade、uh, in the coming year.、Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for joining us. We have some great speakers here, and let me tell you a little bit about a few of them.、Uh, we work very closely here in the United States with our rice researchers, and you're going to hear from two of the premier researchers in their in their Respective fields. One is Jared Harkey. He's from Arkansas, where over 50% of the rice in the United States is grown. And then from California, Bruce Lindquist. They will each give you a crop update from their respective states. And you'll also get to hear from USDA's Nathan Childs, who's、um, who's an expert on sort of the global rice trade. And we're really, really pleased to have、uh, with us today、uh, our Under Secretary of Agriculture for Trade and Foreign Affairs. His name is Ted McKinney.、Uh, he's traveled several times to your your country to meet with his counterparts. He led agricultural trade missions there, and he's been a real champion for the rice industry over the years. And then another great friend to our industry is Bobby Ritchie, who's based there in Shanghai,、um, and he's also with USDA. And he's going to talk a little bit about the outlook for agricultural trade between the U.S. and China in the coming year, with a focus on rice. So I hope you walk away from this seminar confident in the quality and variety of rice available to you from our market. We're very, very proud of the product that we grow. Our farmers work really hard to have a healthy, sustainable, and safe、uh, rice product, and we really look forward to a greater trade between our two countries. I'll now hand it over to Daniel Chen, who will give you some information about USA Rice and the activities that we're actually already doing in the China market. We hope you enjoy the the webinar. Thank you. 谢谢 Betsy， 女士们、乡村们、行业里面的朋友们，早上好！我是美国稻米协会中国首席代表陈耀俊。我们从二零零六年开始，就好像刚才 Betsy 讲到的，开始探讨
美国大米出口到中国的机会。在这个漫长的过程当中呢，我们深深了解到大米对于中国老百姓的重要性，也体会到中国政府、行业跟消费者对于大米的营养、质量。以及食品安全的高度重视跟严格要求，所以得到批准从美国大呃进口大米，对于美国的行业来说呢，是一个呃非常重要的认可。对于出口商来说呢，也是特别重要的，踏出特别重要的一步。那么在过去那那段时间呢，其实我们。在得到批准了以后，我们去加强了在中国市市场的联系跟推广的活动。那么，我们已经组织了两次呃贸易代表团到中国来访问，呃，但是同时间我们也安排了三个批次的中国行业代表到美国去去参访，包括实地的考察、参观加工厂。也有也有更多的呃商务的洽谈，这个对于建立一个稳固的呃长远发展的基础，我们觉得是非常重要的。同样的，我们在美国呃的代表团也在中国举办了三个大米的研讨会，分别在上海、广州、深圳啊、呃、来举办的。那么在美国。大米出口商也参与了去年在上海的环球食品展，也跟上广州的呃大米高峰论坛，呃，也更加上在两个月以前，我们在上海也参与了那个呃中国食品展、中食展展，呃，这一些呃活动，我们都是得到非常正面的。反应，那么呃，我们会在呃十一月十到十二号，在上海第二次参加上海环球食品展，来争取进一步的沟通，促进贸易。我们准备了美国大米的样本，跟呃资料行业的资料，呃，跟更新的菜谱，特别重要的是我们会。带来一份啊、呃，里面包括三十二家批准的美国出口商啊、呃、的名录，来跟他来跟大家探讨那个呃呃出口的商机。那么我们的团队包括周静啊、陈、呃、真、姚一锦呃，都会在现场期待你的光临。那么啊、呃，今天我再一次感谢大家参与。呃呃，今天我们的活动，那么现在我就把下面的时间交给美国农业部副部长，那 k i n n y 先生是欢迎词。Hello, everyone. I'm Ted McKinney. I'm so blessed to serve as your Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs. At our beloved U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to this webinar about U.S. rice. I've probably met some of you in my travels since 2017. I'd much rather be seeing you in person, shaking your hand, greeting you more appropriately. But unfortunately, this pandemic has kept me from getting to China for quite some time to meet you in person and to show you the advantages of buying U.S. rice. Nevertheless. I'm excited to talk with you virtually today about our long and our productive trade partnership. In this case, about U.S. rice in particular. You're about to learn about the qualities of the 2020 and 2021 U.S. rice crop, and all indications I've had is that it's looking pretty good. You'll be pleased with the benefits you're going to receive from this year's crop. I'm pleased that USDA designated the Agriculture and Export Supply Chain, or chains, as an essential business, and that kept exports flowing reliably in spite of the many challenges we've all faced during this pandemic, and that includes rice. We thank the brave folks who kept at it even in the midst of this crisis to keep growing, milling, 
moving and other logistical needs the crop to keep the U.S. rice industry open for business throughout the pandemic. No closing. As we look to the future, we want you to know that this administration and everyone in USDA is going to continue doing all we can to support the phase one trade deal that the U.S. and our friends in China signed on January 15 and thus grow the opportunity for our countries to solidify this deal through the sales of agricultural commodities, especially rice. And that includes us purchasing from you as well. After several rounds of challenging negotiations, USDA successfully addressed China's requirement for authorizing access for U.S. rice. It involved definitions and so many other aspects, but we got there and we crossed the finish line and we're very, very grateful to our friends, primarily with the Ministry of Ag and Rural Affairs. This enormous achievement could not, would not have been realized without the support of the U.S. rice industry and a commitment to find an agreement on both sides. So, despite China's 25% retaliatory tariff on U.S. rice, we appreciate the exclusion process on rice and so many other products, I might add, which allows Chinese companies to request an exemption from the tariffs. We've seen the process work pretty smoothly for many importers across many different commodities. Again, grateful. I'm confident that U.S. rice will be an attractive option for Chinese traders, importers, distributors, retailers, and perhaps most importantly, your consumers who will benefit from this partnership. Last year was the first year that U.S. rice was officially eligible to enter China. USA Rice conducted multiple seminars, trade shows, industry conferences, and interestingly, a reverse trade mission where Chinese friends came here to look at the crop and the milled product and so much more. All of this was done to prove the consistency, the reliability, and the quality of U.S. rice. So anyone who has visited U.S. rice milling plants or farms or research centers can attest to the dependable characteristics of U.S. rice, its quality and processing attributes, and the high standard of food safety across the board. We look forward to increased engagement in China as we build on the progress begun by year one of phase one agreement. And further, we're optimistic that the increased market access afforded by the agreement will benefit both of us. That's the win-win we both seek. We look forward to working with the Chinese importers and the Chinese government to identify high value U.S. products as they make increasing efforts to meet China's purchase commitments under the phase one agreement. One great way to achieve this goal is to buy plenty of high quality U.S. rice at win-win for both countries. You knew I had to say that. The trade relationship between China and the U.S has come a long way in the last few years. While I have to acknowledge that there are challenges in the relationship between our two countries, agriculture and food continues to be a bright spot. At least I hope it continues to be. I've forged a relationship with Vice Minister Han Jun, who I admire greatly, and his colleagues, and I'm confident we will continue to work together. We at USDA and the rice industry are eager to build a strong relationship with all of you, all of you. And so, until I can do so in person again, I wanna thank all of you for your interest in U.S. rice, for your partnership with the fine families who grow U.S. rice, and most of all, for your business. I wish you much success and a profitable year ahead. Thank you. Thank you. 农业部副部长 Ted McKinney 先生的演讲。那接下来呢，由来自阿肯色州大学、加州大学、美国农业部三位资深农学家和经济学家和大家分享2020年美国和全球稻米种植和生产情况。Hello, I'm Jared Arkey, Rice Extension Agronomist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. 
Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the state of Arkansas, acreage cultivars, uh, sustainability practices, and some of our export markets. Focusing on the acreage and cultivars, uh, first I would like to highlight the location of the state of Arkansas within the United States. You can see that the highlighted portion in white would be the eastern Arkansas area where the majority of rice production occurs in the state. I would also like to take a moment to highlight that rice production in the United States also occurs in the Boot Hill or southeastern area of Missouri, the Delta portion of Mississippi, the southwestern, primarily the southwestern area of Louisiana, the Gulf Coast area of Texas, and in California as well in the West. There are a few other states that have extremely small rice acreages, but those do represent the, the six primary rice producing states. Within the state of Arkansas, there are some, some very different production regions as they are known. This area highlighted in blue, uh, roughly a three county area, uh, is an area commonly referred to as the Grand Prairie region. This is an area that, that 100 years or so ago uh, was still largely in native prairie and is still today where some of our highest rice yields occur annually. The region highlighted in, in an orange color is the upper White River area. And this is actually now where the majority of rice production occurs within the state. This area combined with the Grand Prairie is, is by far the vast majority of acres. And the area in green is, is more of what is referred to as the Delta region, again, with the Mississippi River. So this referring to the, the, the Arkansas Delta or Mississippi River Delta region of the state highlighted by, by heavier clay Delta type soils for that production region. And then a number of other counties are also highlighted where some acreage of rice is also grown, the Arkansas River Valley uh, in the western to northwestern portion of the state, and then in some other river valley areas in the southwest portion of the state. Now added to the map are some actual acreage numbers, again, represented by acres for individual counties. The take home here uh, is simply to point out the five counties in 2020 uh, with the highest total production acres in the state three of them in the Northeast area in Poinsett, Jackson, and Cross Counties, and the other two being in the Grand Prairie region with Lone Oak and Arkansas Counties. Total Arkansas rice acreage has really increased dramatically since the late 70s. Once acreage controls were removed, uh, we've seen a consistent increase in overall rice acres through the 80s and 90s. And finally, once we reach the early 2000s, uh, from 2000 to 2010, acreage has overall been, was fairly consistent through that time. Uh, an extremely high production year in 2010. Since that time, uh, acreage has been reduced and has become somewhat more volatile, still remaining consistently over 1 million acres in the state. Uh, but with, with average ups and downs over the last 10 years, um, the 20 to 25% increase to decrease range. And in the 2020 season, uh, we did see a 25% acreage increase over the acreage that occurred in 2019, uh, which was also itself a 25% reduction from 2018 acreage. Overall Arkansas state average rice yields have, have also increased uh, very noticeably over time, even since the early 2000s, uh, to where we are now uh, in the neighborhood of 167 bushels per acre as a forecast yield for this year. That is equivalent to 7,500 pounds of rough rice per acre. A few comments about uh, our, our choices in production. Uh, the, these numbers are preliminary estimates at this time, but we have continued to see an increase in hybrid rice production, somewhere close to 70% of total rice acres in Arkansas uh, are, are projected to have been planted in 2020, which is a continued increase over 2018 and 2019, uh, which were both over 50% in those years. 
Within the Mid-South primarily, we do have non-GMO herbicide technology, rice cultivars that were selected and known to have some tolerance to very specific herbicides, and, and those are now grown on a certain percentage of acres. So the yellow bar constitutes uh, what we refer to as clear field or full page uh, products or cultivars that are tolerant to imidazolinone herbicides. And then the, the blue portion of the bar refers to currently the Provisia technology, uh, which is, uh, uh, again, an emerging herbicide technology that, that is resistant to ACCA's family of herbicides. Overall harvested rice acreage by type, the yellow portion of the bar, again, referring to percent of acres here, the yellow portion of the bars would be a percentage of long grain grown in the state of Arkansas each year, and the blue portion of the bar referring to medium grain. So on an annual basis, 85 to 90 percent of our production is long grain. And uh, th this is actually going far back in history originally with the kind of the onset of the rice industry in Arkansas. Uh, a lot of that was actually medium grain in the beginning, but obviously now we're, we're a very large long grain producer, but uh, the majority of our medium grain acres are grown and produced for domestic use in food and exported to Taiwan. Weather impacts on the 2020 crop have been substantial. The most noticeable issue has been that of frequent, consistent, heavy rainfall throughout the year. Uh, the, the, the darker area and the darker line present represents the, the long-term uh, precipitation average. And the, the, what, what is graphed above it would be the actual 2020 observed precipitation at the Stuttgart, Arkansas location. So we have been well above uh, the average throughout the year since just into the, the beginning of the year with our production season coinciding roughly with the end of March indicated here to where we are now still attempting to complete harvest. And you can see that we have already exceeded our average annual total rainfall with still the two to two and a half months of the year left that are often our wettest uh, portions of the year. So we may see a substantial further increase in rainfall. In the northeast area of the state, uh, using Jonesboro, Arkansas, which is kind of the, the center of the northeast Arkansas production area, it is also substantially above normal on rainfall, this scale is slightly different, so it's not quite as high on rainfall, but it has also already equaled the total amount of rainfall for the year. And you can see some periods of extremely heavy rainfall uh, that occurred at various times. With that continued frequent rainfall throughout the year, uh, this is a look at our rice planting progress by, by week of the year over time. And if you look at the yellow line that represents 2020, uh, the, the black line is 2019. So this uh, includes essentially all year since 1981. On the slide, uh, you can see pretty slow overall, not very many years in which we had slower progress. And in terms of recent years of concern, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, one of the absolute slowest in recent memory uh, that we have to look at. The same argument is true by extension when we look at harvest progress uh, with how we were slowed in our planning effort, uh, that the, the harvest progress has also been very slow. Um, and again, still even, even well behind that of 2019 as we have dealt with, with multiple hurricane events in the fall, just in the last few weeks, actually uh, dumping some pretty large rainfall amounts and, and subsequent storms uh, to disrupt harvest progress. Prevented planting refers to those acres that were originally uh, reported as intended to be planted by growers. And once a, a certain date has been passed where, where rice production is no longer con considered uh, as viable, those acres are reported as prevented planting when they move to plant a different crop or to not plant any crop at all. And 2019 was, it was a record level of that prevented planting with over 500,000 acres. And in 2020, that number was still over 350,000 acres. Uh, even with the acreage increase that we saw in 2020, uh, the, the, the goal of planting uh, even far more acres beyond that was not able to be realized. 
a few comments on sustainability practices that, that, that we're currently pursuing in the state of Arkansas. We have had a, a development over time of a change in the way that we plant rice. Certainly rice in the Mid-South is predominantly planted in a, in a direct seeded method, a dry seeded, direct seeded method with a delayed flood. Most often uh, this is planted using conventional tillage practices. That is the, the ground or soil is tilled immediately prior to planting. So that would be our conventional tillage or conventional planting method. And we've seen an increase over time of a, what's referred to as a stale seedbed method where, where the soil is prepared earlier and then um, left, left stale or, or not tilled uh, once we actually move in the field to plant with uh, that, that leading to a reduction in tillage and soil disturbance efforts. And there has, has for many years been uh, a relatively stable amount of no-till uh, where we do not till the soil at all from one crop to the next. Again, all of this being a movement toward the stale seed bed and no-till, uh, having a reduction in, in overall tillage that occurs in the field. We've also seen some dramatic changes in our irrigation methods over the last 20 years with uh, what's referred to in the yellow bars as a flood, referring to a cascade flood system where we actually form levees and if you look at, at the image, put in a, a gate or a spill of some sort in the levee to allow water to flow through and spill from one paddy to the next down through the field until the entire field and all paddies uh, do have a flood on them. We've instead seen an, an increase by the blue bars in what is referred to as MIRI or multiple inlet rice irrigation, where we're putting water into all of the paddies at the same time to bring the flood up together. A uh, very, very small increase in the gray bars of AWD or alternate wetting and drying, also known as intermittent flooding, uh, where we're deliberately letting the flood level naturally dissipate and dry down before reflooding uh, to, to reduce some, some water use in that situation. But an even more noticeable increase is the FIR or furrow irrigated rice grown in more of an upland style. Uh, that's really increasing in interest the last few years, and we'll touch on a few of the differences between these systems very briefly. Um, again, the fur irrigated rice is the one that's, that, that's gaining the most attention in the state of Arkansas the past few years, also referred to as row rice, where you can see from the image that, that rice is planted in the field and, and furrows formed either before or after planting uh, as a way to, to convey water down the field. Again, you do not see any levees, and this is a field with substantial slope uh, to carry the water down the field. So rice does not require flood as a semi-aquatic plant, but it is susceptible to uh, water deficit stress or moisture deficit stress. Uh, but the move toward a fur irrigated system does allow for easier rotation with other crops that we rotate with in Arkansas, such as soybean, corn, and even some cotton. Uh, there can be a substantial saving on land management and tillage cost. Again, no levees to speak of, and, and the, the beds and furrows used in this situation can be reused on a following crop or, or a previous crop's bed, say soybean, that we may grow on, on a bedded system. Those beds can be reutilized in the, the following year to plant rice on, again, requiring essentially no tillage. There's also the potential for reduced water use in this system, though that is very situation specific. Alternate wetting and drying or AWD, again also referred to as intermittent flooding, is, is another practice that, that was increasing in adoption, but that, that increase has somewhat stabilized as furrow irrigated rice uh, interest increase, so this adoption is small. But the, the water savings where we're actually, again, allowing the, the water level to subside and, and go back to more of a muddy field state before we ever apply more water and bring the flood depth back up has, has shown some substantial water savings by, by using that method. But it is a, a risky practice where an adequate and well-managed water supply is, is not available. So it is not for every field. 
MIRI or multiple inlet rice irrigation, uh, where we use poly pipe to again put put water into each paddy at the same time. You can still see the the spill or gate system through the paddies still present, but those are set very high to to not actually want to allow water to cross over. Instead, the poly pipe is laid down through the field where we actually punch holes in the pipe and allow water into each paddy so they're all brought up uniformly at the same time, uh, which, which aids not only in, in, in decreasing water use tremendously, but also um, increasing our time to flood fertilizer efficiency, uh, efficiency of herbicide applications, uh, a lot of positives to using that, that technology. Some other sustainability practices that, that we rely heavily on, uh, one would be soil fertility or soil testing, primarily looking at our macronutrients such as phosphorus and potassium. Also, we have uh, zinc fertility concerns that we're looking at. The nitrogen soil test for rice, also referred to as NSTAR, as the first uh, nitrogen soil test to be able to give essentially prescription nitrogen rate recommendations for a given field for the cultivar being grown there uh, to, to give the proper nitrogen rate to, rather than ending up with uh, less or more nitrogen than is required to produce uh, the maximum crop yields. The Green Seeker handheld for mid-season nitrogen management, which allows us to, to use using NDBI uh, to determine whether or not more nitrogen is needed for a given crop at the, at the mid-season or top dress timing, an increase in the use of cover crops, again, to manage soil tillage and even retain or increase native soil nitrogen in those situations, and increased use of seed treatments, both fungicides and insecticides, to mitigate issues with seedling diseases and, and uh, soil-borne insect pests which can be a problem and these help to reduce our reliance on foliar sprays of those products. And we also incorporate treatment thresholds for disease and insect pests. Again, uh, relying on those action thresholds based on economic benefit to not make those applications when they don't have an, an economic benefit. A few brief comments uh, just to highlight some of the export markets for Arkansas and, and much of the Mid-South as a whole. Uh, listed in relative order of the amount of tonnage exported to Mexico, Haiti, Central America as a, as a group of countries, Canada, Colombia, uh, United Kingdom or UK, Venezuela, Iraq, and Taiwan, which is already mentioned earlier as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, once again, I'm Jared Hardke, Rice Extension Agronomist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to uh, thank you for the opportunity to share this report. Um, my name is Bruce Lindquist. I'm the uh, University of California uh, Rice Specialist based at uh, University of California, Davis. And today I'm going to give you just a brief uh, 2020 report on the California rice uh, system and an update on this year's rice crop. Uh, just by way of a brief interview, um, I'm going to introduce the, the California rice system so you have a familiarity with it, uh, touch on California rice exports, look particularly at this uh, current season, and then finish off with some of the sustainability practices that are used in California. So first of all, I'd like to uh, just explain briefly uh, the calendar that the California rice system is on. Um, it's a little later than you would see in the Mid-South. Uh, typically, we're doing uh, field preparation in, in March and April. The bulk of rice is planted um, in the first few weeks of, of May. Uh, right now, we're finishing up harvest. We have probably about 75 percent of the rice harvest finished as I'm giving this talk on October 16th. So very briefly about the uh, rice, California rice system, it is a bit different uh, than you would, um, than most, most other systems. Um, our growing system is, as I've just said, is, is April through October, about 150 days from planting to harvest. What's unique is, is that we're primarily a water seeded system. Uh, what this means is, is that we 
flood the fields before we plant them, and then the fields are aerial, aerially seeded uh, into standing water, and the fields are generally uh, flooded for the entire uh, system. There may be some uh, times during the season where water comes off, maybe for an herbicide application, but generally the goal is to keep this, the uh, fields flooded from uh, planting till about maybe six weeks before harvest when they're drained so that combines can get in. California primarily produces medium grain rice, um, and I'll get into that just in the next slide a little bit. Very high yielding, uh, the highest yields uh, in the US are out of uh, California. We have a very favorable environment, um, long days, uh, very high solar radiation, um, and very little insect and disease pressure. California is also a highly regulated uh, production system uh, due to uh, the regulations in the state of California. And just as a reminder, all rice grown in California is, is non-GMO. So just a few more details about rice. Again, 90% of California rice is for the medium grain market, and you'll see that um, in our exports in, in a little while. The rest is made up of short, um, long, and some specialty uh, rice grain types. Um, California really focuses on high quality, medium grain uh, rice uh, for, uh, for our markets. About 5% of the area in California is, is grown under organic rice production. So I mentioned earlier that our yields are quite high. Um, on average, they're about nine and a half metric tons uh, per hectare. And you can kind of see this over the past maybe 10 years, uh, we're, we're achieving that. Uh, these, the scale here is pounds, 100 pounds per acre, but that 8,500, which is our average, translates to 9.5 metric tons uh, per hectare. Our highest yields in California uh, were in 2015, where we achieved almost 10 tons on, uh, per hectare statewide. So California is uh, over here on the west coast of the U.S. Um, we're the second um, largest rice area in the U.S. Uh, after Arkansas. In an average year, California is, is roughly 20% uh, of, of the area of, of U.S. rice. On average, we have about half a million acres or about 200,000 uh, uh, hectares. And you can see over this in this graph that uh, acreage can vary a bit. A lot of the recent variation in area is due to some of the drought uh, years that we've been experiencing. So briefly, um, in terms of our uh, exports, in a typical year, um, about 50% uh, mm -hmm. of California rice is used domestically. Our biggest market is to Japan, about 25% of the rice goes there. And you can see that that uh, held true. This is typical and this is what is sort of actual for, for last year. And so Japan, again, about a quarter. Um, South Korea is our next largest market with about um, anywhere from 10 to 15%. And then uh, we have Middle East, Turkey, Canada, EU, uh, rounding out uh, the rest of, of our uh, export markets. So I just wanted to touch base quickly on the 2020 season, um, just to kind of give a sense of, of where we might be. Again, we're still in the harvest time, so we don't really know what our yields are looking like, but um, just wanted to go over the season a bit. Uh, COVID uh, certainly affected a lot globally, but really it had a relatively small impact on the California rice season. Uh, early in the season due to supply chain issues, aqua ammonia is the primary fertilizer nitrogen source uh, for California rice systems. Uh, there was a shortage early on um, due to supply chain related to COVID. This delayed uh, some of the fertilization and thus planting in some rice fields. It doesn't seem to have had a large negative impact apart from the delay in, in planting. 
rice area uh, this year was uh, 208,000 hectares, 17% of total uh, U.S. rice uh, area. And as we're, again, as we're um, talking right now, uh, rice harvest is, is about 75% through. We have very good um, harvesting conditions. It's been a very dry, warm uh, fall, which is good for harvesting. Again, we need rain uh, from the state, but certainly for rice harvest, it's very good for that. Um, we're guessing right now, based on what we're kind of seeing coming in, that yields are gonna be fairly average at about nine and a half ton per hectare. We're not really sure about the quality. Again, quality is a big uh, issue for us. And we've heard varying reports on, in terms of, of quality uh, this year. Um, some that saying is very good, and we've heard others where it's been really quite poor. So we, we have to kind of wait and see uh, what, what's gonna hold out for that. Certainly one of the big issues and maybe seen on the news um, is the issues with wildfires and smoke. Um, if you look at um, this, this year, it's been a, a really tough year uh, for the state of California with all the smoke. Um, what we've seen here in terms of relationship to the rice season, um, this is a, what I'm showing here is solar radiation and, and certainly uh, it's, it's an, gives a, uh, an idea of uh, air quality, but also obviously uh, plants need the solar radiation um, for producing um, grain and, and, and biomass. So I, what I've just shown here is this dark line is, is what we would say is, is a fairly typical year, the solid line. And then these other points are uh, different uh, stations within the rice growing area. And you can see that um, there have been periods where solar radiation, average solar radiation over a day has really dropped um, uh, to very low levels uh, due to the amount of smoke in the air. Uh, this is all occurring uh, primarily during grain fill and ripening uh, stage. So it didn't occur uh, that much. And there were still some um, rice uh, in, in flowering heading stage um, when the smoke had, but most of it, uh, uh, most of the rice was during grain fill and ripening. This has, the, has had the effect of delaying a little bit the, the time to harvest. Um, it doesn't seem to have affected uh, yields um, in, in that much of a negative uh, way. Again, we're still waiting to see if it might have had a negative effect on quality. So I just want to touch on some of the sustainability practices that um, California rice growers are doing. I'm going to look at air quality, water quality, nitrogen management, water use, and habitat. Um, from an air quality perspective, um, there's a number of, of, of issues that uh, just touch very quickly on. Uh, first is drift control. Herbicide drift is a big issue. Um, it, it, if the drift goes on to neighboring crops, particularly other uh, non-rice crops such as walnut, um, almonds, um, as well as some other field crops that might be sensitive to rice herbicides. Um, and there's obviously the human component where it's an issue as well. There's a continual uh, direct move toward more granular uh, herbicides where there's less drift. Um, there's also strict wind restrictions put in place, no fly zones um, around certain types of crops or residential areas. And there's in, increased use of, of in-field applicators. Over here, this is a steel wheel tractor that's commonly used uh, to apply herbicides during the season. It can go, it can drive through a flooded field um, and apply the herbicides or pe other pesticides uh, very close to the crop canopy and, and really reduce uh, drift control. Uh, the other big air quality um, issue that is uh, prevalent in California is, is related to straw burning in the winter. I'm gonna discuss this a little bit later, but um, we're in California about, currently about 10 to 12% of the rice acreage is, is burned. And we'll discuss that in a little bit. 
The other issue is, is, is water quality. And again, uh, getting back to pesticide uh, applications, um, all pesticides uh, will have some sort of hold time. Um, and a hold time is, uh, what is referring to the water needs to be held inside the field. It can't be released from the field after pesticide applications. The length of these uh, hold times varies depending on the pesticide, and it's based on uh, the degradation curve of a particular pesticide. Um, so the hold times can vary from a couple of days up to 28 days, uh, depending on the pesticide in question. And again, in terms of water quality, we have already mentioned the use of granular herbicides. The other thing is uh, drift of herbicides into nearby water canals. So with granular herbicides, the neighboring water around rice fields is more protected uh, from uh, any kind of uh, pesticides going into those canals. There's also a nitrate, um, nitrate monitoring in, in ground uh, wells around uh, the uh, rice area. The, the dark green area in this map is, is, the, is the rice area. Within that area, there's a number, I think there's maybe eight right now, uh, monitoring wells that are located in rice intensive areas to look for uh, nitrate in the groundwater. Generally, we see very little nitrate in, in the groundwater using the management practices that we currently use, but it is constantly being monitored. Uh, continuing on uh, with nitrogen management, um, there is farm level nitrogen management plans that, have, that all farmers have to um, uh, submit, uh, which tells uh, how they're gonna be managing their nitrogen in every field. Um, so that's uh, a level of um, paperwork that um, is, is necessary for all farmers. Um, the, and again, I just discussed the groundwater monitoring for nitrate. Uh, they're increasing use of, uh, these aren't mandatory by any stretch of the imagination, but there is increased use of uh, decision aids for helping growers know when additional fertilizer might be needed. Um, it's an ongoing area of research as well, but uh, it's, it's being fairly widely adopted by, by growers in California. Water use is obviously a big concern. I, I mentioned earlier on droughts and uh, droughts in California is, is nothing new. Um, also water use in California is quite high. Um, unlike most other areas where rice is grown, uh, we really have no rainfall during the growing season. Um, all our rainfall is in the winter, primarily between November and maybe March is when uh, probably 90 to 95% of the rainfall occurs. And so all of our water uh, is, is from uh, snow melt and rainfall that's collected in, in large reservoirs uh, in, in the Sierra Mountain, uh, mountain range primarily. There is also some reservoirs on the coastal ranges that supply irrigation water, but primarily for the rice area, the water comes from the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, so snow and rainfall in those mountains is very important for our water. And they're uh, collected in these um, reservoirs. It's delivered by surface irrigation by different water districts. And 95% of irrigation is, is the surface water. About 5% is is taken from wells, which is something else that's rather unique to California compared to other parts of the, of the US. During uh, drought years, um, the amount of water, water from wells does increase a little bit. On a regulatory side, there is increased uh, level of monitoring of water use at the field level. This is a, 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 just a picture showing a, a meter. Um, that, that a flow meter going into a field that will be measuring um, water going in. And so that this is um, more and more, we're seeing uh, this put in by different irrigation districts to uh, regulate 
water use in, in, in rice systems. So I talked earlier about air quality and burning. Um, up until uh, the early 1990s, just about all rice straw was burned. Uh, you can see that in this graph, about 90, about 95% of the rice straw was burned. Uh, certainly air quality was a big concern. There was regulations that were put in place in the early 1990s to phase out straw burning. And currently about eight to 12% of the rice area is burned. You need permits to, to do this um, and they're hard to get. About 10% of straw is baled. And this has led to great improvements in terms of air quality um, and in terms of wildlife. And so a typical, in, in the winter, a typical management is, is straw is either chopped um, or stomped in. This is a tractor kind of in a flooded field just pressing the straw into the, into the rice field. Um, if it's chopped, they'll then incorporate it and flood it uh, during the winter. And this helps decompose the rice straw uh, so that it's not a problem in the following year. The other benefit that's come along with this is that um, California is in the Pacific flyaway and the number of birds uh, using uh, California uh, rice fields for, for habitat during the winter is, is, has skyrocketed. Um, over 12 million uh, migrating waterfowl use California rice lands. And this is in addition to a lot of other shorebirds and waterbirds throughout the year. In addition, the California Rice Commission has numerous um, waterfowl programs with NGOs, state and federal agencies to further enhance uh, wildlife habitat in, in rice systems. And this includes not just birds, but it extends to other animals, as well, even as, as well as fish. So a lot of programs going on related to that. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Good morning. Uh, delighted to be part of this webinar series. This morning, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes on the global rice market. As you can see from the title, uh, global trade is expected to increase in 2021, and stocks, supplies, and produ production are all expected to be record high. We'll look at those major themes for about the next 20 minutes. First thing, I have one text slide here, and I'm going to go over some main points, which I've somewhat in already indicated. The first is we're looking at record production in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, record production. Stable production is projected for East Asia. Uh, no record crops, but all bumper or only drift uh, as in Japan or, or Korea drifting down perhaps slightly, but not much. And some crop recovery in Southeast Asia, which suffered from drought in 1920 and still has uh, water deficit issues in 2021. Global consumption and residual use is projected at a record high, but less, less than production, with China accounting for most of the increase, probably about 2 million tons, and India's domestic and residual use remaining very high, record high, due to its uh, pandemic-related food relief program. So India's consumption has jumped in uh, 1920, and it's uh, going to stay above, above normal, typical levels in 2021. Global trades projected an increase about 3% in 21. 20 was limited somewhat by the pandemic. There were several export restrictions, limitations, logistic disruptions. Most of those, the, the restrictions are, have been removed and most of the, some of the disruptions, most of the disruptions, especially in India, have eased off. But nonetheless, trade was down a little in 2020. Uh, in 2021, India and Thailand will increase exports uh, and Thailand will return as number two. India will remain number one. Exportable, exportable supplies and Mercosur, which is a, basically Southern South America, Venezuela, of course, is a member, but currently not an export, um, is remaining extremely tight until the harvest of the spring 2021 crop. And that will likely uh, expand U.S. exports to Latin America, the top market for US, U.S. exports. Global rice ending stocks in 21 are projected to be record high, and this will be the 14th consecutive year of an increase in global ending stocks, record high projected. 
look at uh, production, carry in, of course, you add them together, it's total supply. It is record, projected record high in 2021, record production, record carry in. Production's not always a record, by the way. Uh, often it's a record, but not every year. 15, 16 global production was down somewhat. That was an El Nino. But 2021, looking at global record production, uh, record crops in South Asia, a uh, big producing region, huge producing region. Uh, so far, very few weather related production problems for 2021, although it is early. We'll look more at some specific countries. Uh, a map on China. Uh, notice that China, although China's crop is currently projected at 147 million tons, a little bit below record, fractionally above of last year, it had major weather problems during the summer. Uh, extremely heavy rains really began somewhat in June, but certainly July and August in the southeast, Yangtze River Basin, some of the areas had historic rainfall and flooding. Then in uh, early September, typhoon um, hit the northeast. It caused some damage uh, to yields, not a lot. It was the early crop in the southeast that was most damaged, although the crop is actually up from a year ago due to uh, expanded area. You, uh, the yield was harmed, of course, by the heavy rainfall. The typhoon, Mazic, struck, I believe, real early September, maybe third, fourth, or I think it struck the third, fourth, or fifth of September up in the Northeast. The yellow numbers, they represent the share of China's typical production accounted for by that province. You can see the lower Yangtze River Valley, lots of rice is produced in that area. However, uh, production is expected to be up slightly, uh, but not record, not record. Uh, looking at China and India, why do I focus on them? They're the two largest producers. No one else is even close. They're the largest producers by a very wide margin. Uh, look at China, the largest producer, crop up a little bit, but it's still below record. Uh, China's crop was well over 148 million tons. It's projected about 147 million tons. Not a big drop, not, not a big drop. Um, India, India is a more interesting story by a big margin. Five consecutive record crops in a row, uh, 120 million ton crop in 2021. So far looks very good. Rainfall for the monsoon was reported in June through the end of August at about 10% above normal. August had especially heavy rainfall. Uh, looking like so that means reservoirs will be adequate for the Rabi crop. Remember they do a carif crop, which is the bulk of the crop uh, planted in the summer har harvesting now. And then the Rabi crop in the spring uh, which will all be irrigated. So five consecutive records, typ typically pretty decent monsoons. Those are the two largest growers. Let's look at a few more maps. I'm shifting to Southeast Asia now, which I referenced earlier. Southeast Asia uh, had, was most of, I'm talking mostly the mainland Southeast Asia, was in drought in 1920. Um, the uh, rainy season started late, ended early. So res reservoirs were not recharged. Thailand's crop was especially hurt in 1920. It was really the second crop, which is almost all irrigated, not quite all, but almost all. I believe its area was down not quite 50%, but almost. Um, Vietnam's crop drifted down a little bit last year. That's last year. Uh, Burma's crop was off a, a little bit. Nonetheless, after the this year, there has been more rainfall, but there's still dry areas. The, southern part of Burma, uh, Burma Delta, that's the real southern part where a lot of rice is grown. Uh, Laos is still quite dry. Now, this map ended August 30th, of course. Parts of Vietnam are still quite dry, but I'm bringing you, I'm going to show you next an updated map, and it's a little bit more rainfall, but there's still areas that are, that are somewhat deficit. Uh, the southern part of Burma, the rice bowl, uh, that's still quite deficit. Uh, Laos is Laos has some difficulties. Uh, Thailand's second crop, while expected to be up somewhat from the year ago, extremely weak crop is still projected historically quite low. Vietnam's production continues to drift down. Burma, uh, some recovery, but nowhere near record. So some dry dryness in Southeast Asia, issues with, with recharging reservoirs. Going back to some charts, I wanna look at both Thailand and Vietnam both Southeast Asian exporters. Uh, the Thailand, you can just see last year, 
the crop. It was mostly the second crop. That, that was just really hard by the drought. That goes back to the 1516 drought. It wasn't quite as severe, but it was severe enough that it reduced supplies. You can see with Vietnam, and Vietnam's not a, um, it, it, it's not dramatic, but it's been drifting down. Vietnam's production is well below, is below record. It's not well below, but it is below record. And it's drifting down mostly due to declining area. Vietnam's rice area seems to drop a little bit each year. Much of that, some of that's due to saltwater intrusion, also crop diversification, uh, not always adequate water. So drifting down, nonetheless, well below record, below record. I want to look at other countries. These are not all Southeast Asia, Asia Pakistan, South Asia, but I'll put them on the same chart. You can see Burma, uh, the first one, uh, crop is up a little bit, but still not a full recovery from drought. Cambodia actually is a record. Uh, its production doesn't seem to vary as much. It's a much smaller. Laos, is, uh, I believe, is a record also. The, the real low crop, low crop for Laos, Laos was due to flooding. Philippines down a little bit due to declining area, and that's really due to crop diversification. It's not down a lot, but it is down a little. Pakistan, that's a record crop for Pakistan, 7.6 million tons, record crop for Pakistan. Again, uh, Burma, Cambodia are exporters, Philippines importer, Pakistan an exporter. Look in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, by the way, 90% of rice is produced and consumed in Asia. Outside of Asia, Brazil and the U.S. are the two largest producers in the Western, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, looking at both countries, I look at Brazil. Brazil's crop is projected to drop a little bit, uh, not a lot. Brazil's record was 1011, which you can see, a little bit over 9 million tons. Sh should be a little bit over 7 million in 2021. Brazil's rice area has been dropping since the mid-1970s. That's a long time. <laughs> They had about, Brazil had about 6 million hectares in rice, now about 1.7. Uh, rice is not always profitable. It's a bit risky. Uh, area has just steadily declined in, in Brazil. Um, we, uh, the, the increase is due to a, actually a slight area increase in 2021. Supplies are very tight in Brazil. The United States, as you can see, the U.S. tends to go up and down. A lot of that's weather driven. Last year was a very difficult weather year for the southern growing states. Heavy flooding early in the year, uh, rain throughout the spring and into the summer. Uh, historic prevented plantings. That's last year, of course. This year there was rain and some delay in planting, but not anywhere to the degree of a year ago. A strong crop recovery, almost 23 percent, but as you can see, nowhere near record. Like Brazil, the record was in 2010, uh, so the crop's nowhere near record. Area, of course, is up about 21, 22 percent, nowhere near record, nowhere near record. We'll look at trade now. That's the bulk of global production. Looked at Asia, looked at the Western Hemisphere briefly. The main thing to look at trade, a few things on this chart. Number one, trade is expected up in 2021, only, only about 3 percent, barely 3 percent. It's nowhere near, it's not record. Record was 2017, about 48 million tons. Uh, what I think is also to note is that Sub-Saharan Africa, that strong growth in Sub-Saharan Africa, is the largest importing region. It's larger than Asia, and far more people live in Asia than Sub-Saharan Africa, although Sub-Saharan Africa's population is over a billion, which is a factor in its increasing imports. It's really accounted for most of the growth. As you can see, um, Asia's in the last few years has been modest. Sub-Saharan Africa hasn't grown as much. It's below record a little. Somewhat self-sufficiency policies, concerned about relying on the global market. But Sub-Saharan Africa is the largest importing region, and in recent years has accounted for a lot of the growth. And although it's also increasing production rapidly, consumption, including per capita use, are all rising in Sub-Saharan Africa. Look at the top four rice exporters, India, Thailand, Vietnam, Pakistan. Now, Right now, Vietnam is number two, not Thailand, but I just kept putting them in that order, but typically India, Thailand, Vietnam, Pakistan. As you can see, India is expected to again be the number one. That's a definite boost in India's exports. They're not record, they're close to record, but not quite record high. 
Thailand is expected to increase, but still be quite low. If you notice that gray bar, that's this year. Uh, Thailand had tight supplies due to drought. Its prices were totally uncompetitive. They're still uncompetitive. Uh, those two remain the top exporters. Remember, India exports basmati rice as well as coarse rice. Thailand exports jasmine, glutinous, regular milled, brokens. Vietnam rice exports are expected to drop a little bit, not a lot, but a little. Its crop is drifting down. Not a lot of movement in Vietnam's exports. They tend not to go much higher. They're not record. They were not record. They've had higher before. That's when Thailand had that policy where its prices were about double the global level. Pakistan come up a little bit, not much. Pakistan doesn't do a lot more than 4 million tons and ha would have real difficulty expanding production much more. I'm gonna look at the next four top global rice exporters and it's a clean break. The first four are, are export a fair amount more. Uh, these four look pretty good on the same graph. You can see the US pretty much stable, nowhere near record, nowhere near record. Um, about three eighths record, and, and the US is unlikely to achieve that. China, China's a more interesting story. China is not record. China, I think record was probably around 1998. They did about well over three, 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 way into the mid threes. Uh, they're at two nine, that's a recent high for China. China's selling rice at very low prices. Uh, yeah, Puerto Rico's a market China's grabbed by selling at very low prices throughout the Mediterranean and Sub-Saharan Africa. Burma, Burma's exports are drifting down. Um, it's somewhat odd, but prior to that purple um, bar, Burma was, was making a comeback. But Burma's production just seems hard to go much above, I think, 13 million tons milled basis. It has, its population consumes a lot of rice. You can see it just drifts down. Uh, by the way, as I've said many times, Burma's record exports were just before World War II. Um, erupted in, in, in the Pacific in December 1941. They did about three and a half million tons. Uh, nowhere near that now. Cambodia uh, have come back from years of being absent, but not really pushing much higher. But the big story, China remains very high. Burma drifting down. I want to look at um, China imports now. Those were exports on imports. China's imports remain well below the five point, I think 5.7 million ton record in 2017. Um, that year, China was the largest importer, probably would assume at that level. Uh, imports drifted down. They did not seem to be dropping a whole lot more. Uh, looking at the Philippines, Philippines imports have recently been higher. You can see that on the chart. You can see the red bar. Uh, part of that is their policy, their tarification. Their production has drifted down. It hasn't plummeted, but it has dropped some. Of course, the per capita their consumption's high, their per capita is high, a little bit of increase uh, in their imports. Now, I think two, two, I think two five to two six million tons. These are the two largest importers projected for 2021. I wanna look at a few other major importers. I've sort of mixed some regions a little bit, but uh, if you notice Nigeria, Nigeria's import, I think about 1.2 million tons, up a little from this year, 1 million. Uh, Nigeria had been around two and a half to three for several years. Uh, so Nigeria's imports have dropped sharply. You can see that clearly in the chart, almost like a staircase of just walking down. Uh, Nigeria, there, there are restrictions on imports at border, their foreign exchange restrictions. Nigeria is trying for self-sufficiency. It's certainly a goal, but it's not there. Uh, Nigeria's, that's very low imports for Nigeria given its population size. EU, the EU, like the US, is at record imports. Uh, that is record for the EU. And it's like 2.3 million tons. Their monthly imports have been very large. I didn't put the US up here. The US is at 1.2. It's a record. Both countries, not the EU is, a, is, a, is, not, is not a country, it's a associated community of countries, a union of countries, is at about, is at record, the record, Monthly purchases, the U.S. the same way, very high. Saudi Arabia, that's rather typical. Some of the drop was due to tourism, which declined because of COVID-19 concerns. Iran, that's very typical. Iran will go up a little, down a little. That's very normal. UAE, UAE has doubled its rice imports in a decade. 
uh, 20 years ago, the UAE was probably doing maybe 100, 150,000 tons. They're 1.2 million. It's a lot of rice. I want to look in the Western Hemisphere, back to US and Brazil. Notice Brazil. Uh, imports around 800,000 tons for 2021, down from 850 um, this year. Uh, 850 was the largest since 03. 03 was not a record for Brazil. 98 was a record. But you can see Brazil's had to come back in the import market. You can see a steady walk up to 2020 as supplies have tightened. Uh, Brazil has recently made major purchases of paddy from the United States, well over 100,000 tons. Uh, and that's so far this market year. The United States, I mentioned it earlier, 1.2 million. It is a record. It's phenomenal growth. The growth really picked up this spring. The monthly imports increased from typically maybe 60, 70,000 tons a month to probably 120 to 130,000. They backed off a little bit in August, but by far that is a record. Uh, just a few more slides on, on stocks. What I want to show you, this is uh, the, the Mercosur exporters, so Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay. I've, I've added their stocks. And what I wanted to show you was that that stocks, you can see those, not the last year, 2021, but the two previous years, supplies of rice are tight in the Southern Hemisphere, that, the Southern part of the Southern Hemisphere. Those are the exporters. And they were extremely tight in 20, 1920. They come back a little in 2021. That's why Brazil is importing rice. That's why the exporters are likely backing out of markets in the uh, Caribbean area, like Mexico, Central America. And those markets have opened up somewhat for the United States, Brazil especially, U.S. paddy. Uh, Venezuela has, has recently purchased U.S. paddy. So very tight supplies in that southern exporting region. And global ending stocks projected a 14th consecutive high. This is similar to the chart I showed earlier where they had carry and this is carry out, so it adds one more year. And I, a few things to note, it's just, a, it's just a walk up. I mean, those stocks are just walking up. China's about 65% of global. I think uh, India's probably around 18%. Well, the rest don't, not much left. And it's really China that holds most of it. India's stocks around 30, 32 million, depending on what year. That's a lot of stocks for India. What's dry, you can see what's been driving the changes in global ending stocks, China. China's really been the factor. You can see that it uh, drew its stocks down early in the 20, 21st century, got quite low, then rebuilt them. So in summary, rec for, for 2021, record global supplies led by bumper crops in South Asia and some crop recovery oh. in Southeast Asia, which I went through earlier. Global consumption is record high, China accounting for most of the growth and India's domestic use remaining extremely high due to its government food relief program, which targets about 800 million people with wheat and rice subsidies. Global trade projected increase almost 3%. To 2020 was limited. It was reduced a little, but not a lot, but it was limited by COVID-19, but it's still well below record. And exportable supplies in the uh, Southern Hemisphere remain extremely tight until harvest next spring, supporting U.S. exports to that region. And finally, global ending stocks are projected to be record high, 14th consecutive year. I thank you. I hope you found this webinar informative. Good day.好,谢谢几位博士 Alright, so this protocol between the U.S. and China was signed on July 19th, 2017. On the U.S. side, 
the USDA APHIS Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or the implementation of a sanitary protocol for a memorandum of understanding with the Federal Green Inspection Service. On China's side, the General Administration of Customs in the current process. There are 15 articles described in this protocol. I felt that four of the articles were relevant for China. I'm going to go through those four articles now. Article 1 There are three main rights claims identified by conservation codes. Those are 1006.20. Now, this includes brown husk, like semi meal, and or whole meal, and broken rice. Now, what's article 3? Article 3 covers uh, each uh, complete correct For the U.S. rice export to China, signed in Washington, D.C. on 19 between China and the U.S. Now, number six. Packaging material should be permitted to vacation, comply with China's requirements, and be labeled appropriately. This includes statements. HS code, name and address of the bill or export, and rice priority. All right, and for Article 7, Home Health Inspection Service uh, will provide and has provided the general administration of customs with a list of approved U.S. facilities that meets the requirements of the phytosanitary protocol. Currently, there are three U.S. facilities on administration sites as being committed to export to China from the United States. And other than that, um, I just wanted to mention were that interior supply services were really sensitive for the calls and um, the certificates. And if there are any tests or, or disease issues, please let us know for your time.谢谢Joshua博士的演讲,很抱歉啊,刚才讲演讲的时候呢,声音有些卡顿,我们这边呢有一些听不很多听不清楚,没有关系,我们在之后呢会跟大家再次分享Joshua 那接下来呢,是由美国农业部北京农业事务办公室,农业参展 Bobby Rich先生跟大家谈谈中美农业贸易。Thank you, Irene. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to USA Variety Federation for organizing this seminar on this year's Thank you all for taking the time out of your day to learn more about U.S. rice and its unique attributes. I am certain that the information will be useful and that you will find U.S. rice delicious. Acting Ambassador Bob Porter here at the U.S. Embassy want to ask that I pass along his regards to all of you today.
请大家稍作等候，我们正在做一些技术调整，希望大家能够听到声音。呃，我们现在正在做一些技术调整，调整一下刚才卡顿的声音，请大家耐心等候，谢谢。I apologize for the technical difficulties. Irene, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I will continue. No, it's better. Not voice okay. is better. Can you restart from the beginning? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to USA Rice Federation for organizing the seminar today on US rice. On behalf of the US Embassy, the acting ambassador, Rob Forden, asks that I pass along his best regards to each of you. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to learn more about USA Rice and its unique attributes. Even though I wish I could speak to all of you and meet you in person today, I'm grateful that we're still able to talk about US Rice virtually. I hope to speak with each of you in person someday in the near future. Already this morning, you have heard from several officials and experts about U.S. rice. I want to speak of the trade agreement signed between our two countries in January and the hard work both sides have done and are doing to implement it. I saw firsthand the teamwork of Mara's Vice, Min of, uh, Vice Premier Liu He, U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer, and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. Equally impressive was the work of Mara Vice Minister Han Jun, U.S. Trade, Repre US Trade Representative Ambassador Dowd, and USDA Undersecretary McKinney, and their many technical agricultural experts. They were all dedicated to solving long-standing issues with, re with the goal to remove roadblocks and uncertainty from your work. This was especially true for opening China to U.S. rice. I am proud to share that since the agreement went into force on February 15th, much progress has been made, and it is the brightest spot in our bilateral U.S.-China relationship. On Friday, the U.S. Trade Representative and the U.S. Department of Agriculture released a report giving credit to China for progress in implementing the agreement. And we are happy to see that China has implemented over 50 of the 57 agricultural technical commitments under the agreement. In the report, Ambassador Lighthizer said, since the agreement went into force eight months ago, we have seen remarkable improvements in our agricultural trade relationship with China. And I wholeheartedly agree. In addition, we all have seen the tariff exclusion process for certain retaliatory tariffs run smoothly since it was rolled out by the Chinese government in March. This process has helped importers and consumers across China make their import decisions based upon their own considerations and not impacted by excess tariffs. As we all know, the purchase commitments in the agreement started slow, but have picked up dramatically in recent weeks. Every day, the U.S. Department of Agriculture reports purchases of soybeans, corn, wheat, beef, pork, and poultry by importers in China. I hope to soon be able to count rice in that list as well. Regardless of the concerns that the United States and China are facing in other parts of our relationship, 
concrete actions by both China and the United States show that both countries remain positively engaged and committed to the agricultural trade agreement. Nonetheless, more must be done if the purchase commitments are to be met, and we hope purchases of U.S. rice will be part of this success. We know, you know, that Chinese consumers value safe, competitively priced food and agricultural products, and U.S. rice will be a welcome new choice for them here, all across China. With both the rice protocol and trade agreement now in place, this is a historic moment to be one of the first to bring U.S. rice into China, and I'm sure that Chinese cons consumers will appreciate the value and high quality of U.S. rice. As you have heard, this year in particular has been a good year for U.S. rice production. Planted area and production are up 22%, and the progress of this year's crop in the United States is looking good with harvest nearly complete. Even California, typically the last state to harvest, is already ahead of schedule. Given the additional supplies, expert exports are anticipated to expand in the coming year. The United States is a reliable supplier and able to meet the demands of the Chinese consumers and their preferences. As you heard, the United States produces long grain, medium grain, and short grain rice using the safest and most advanced production technologies. Once the first shipments of U.S. rice arrive, they will be immediately, they will immediately demonstrate the excellent quality and ability to meet the Chinese consumers' needs. You can be assured not only of the quality of U.S. rice, but also the safety. All U.S. rice, whether for domestic consumption or for export, is regulated and inspected by the most stringent USDA standards so that to ensure it meets the highest requirements. The United States Department of Agriculture is here in China to provide in-country assistance and to facilitate trade and import of all U.S. agricultural products. We have offices located in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Xinjiang. My staff and I stand ready to assist you in any way we can in your purchases and consideration of U.S. rice. In closing, we hope that this webinar illustrated for you some of the excellent characteristics and qualities of U.S. rice. I want you to know that the U.S. rice industry and the U.S. Department of Agriculture look forward to strengthening the relationships we have with you and to building new ones as we successfully introduce U.S. rice to Chinese consumers. You can count on us at the U.S. Embassy and as at the U.S. Department of Agriculture as partners as we address current challenges, implement the phase one agreement, and support the tariff exclusion process. Your partnership across China and well-being are important to us as the U.S. farmer seeks to provide safe, nutritious rice to consumers across China. The US, USA Rice Federation, U.S. Rice Farmer, the U.S. Embassy, and I want a productive, profitable, and predictable relationship with you, our partners, for many years to come. Back to you, Irene, and thank you all for your time today. Shisha Dajia.
。OK， 好。哎，好，你好，谢谢 Joshua 博士。对，因为刚才 Joshua 博士讲的时候呢，我们这些呃网络有些卡顿。现在我们请 Joshua 博士再给我们讲一下他这边关于准入细则的内容。谢谢。I apologize. Um, I will try to be a little more clear this time. So I just wanted to comment about the phytosanitary protocol between the United States and China. Um, and My notes indicate that it was signed on July 19th, 2017. This includes rice being exported from the U.S. to China. On the U.S. side, the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, oversees the implementation of the phytosanitary protocol through a memorandum of understanding with the Federal Grain Inspection Service. On China's side, the General Administration of Customs oversees the import clearance process and relative、uh, quarantine needs. Now, there are 15 articles described in the phytosanitary protocol between the United States and China. I felt that four of the articles are relevant for importers here in China. Those four articles include Article one, Article three, Article six, and Article seven. For Article one, three main rice commodities are identified by their HS codes: one zero zero six point two zero, one zero zero six point three zero, one zero zero six point. Four zero. This includes brown, husk, white, semi-milled, or wholly milled, and broken rice. Now on to Article Three. The phytosanitary protocol needs to be completed correctly. I'm sorry. The phytosanitary certificate needs to be completed correctly. And include the following attestation: Protocol of phytosanitary requirements for the U.S. rice exported to China, signed in Washington D.C. on the 19th of July, 2017, between China and the United States. On to Article Six. Packaging material should be. Permeable to fumigation, comply with China's requirements, and be labeled appropriately. Which should include a statement about the product, HS code, name and address of the register mill or exporter, and the correct rice variety. On to Article Seven. The Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service、uh, provides GAC, or the General Administration of Customs, with a list of approved U.S. facilities that meet requirements of the phytosanitary protocol. Currently, there are 32 U.S. facilities registered on the General,、uh, Administra uh, General Administration of Customs website, permitting. The export of U.S. rice to China. All right. Thank you for your attention. I turn the the mic back over. Good. Thank you, Joshua 博士。呃，这次我们声音非常的流畅，也谢谢我们翻译的小伙伴。那接下来呢，就是我们的提问时间。那么，我想问一下。呃，尊敬的 Bobby Richie 先生，他还在吗？因为我们这边有一个是关于野米的问题，准入的问题，希望想看看他能不能来回答。啊 ，Bobby 你好，现在是有一个关于野米的问题，我们这边有进口商问，美国野米什么时候可以进入中国？Currently, wild rice is not eligible to export to China from the United States. However, I'm sure、um, 
once an, uh, a request for those for that to occur, our plant and health uh, inspection authorities from the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service would take that topic up with their colleagues at China's General Administration for Customs.谢谢包比先生那我们在整个过程中呢我们的听众跟参与者都非常的踊跃那么是想了解一下就是说主要是在什么地区是什么原因那么这个问题我们请美国道米协会亚洲推广委员会主席 Chris Crutchfield先生做一下回答 Good evening, good morning, and good day wherever you're viewing this webinar from uh, and uh, thank you uh, for, for the question. Uh, we're very fortunate here in the United States uh, to produce uh, a lot of food and, and we actually do not have food shortages. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, there was uh, what, I, what we would refer to as some panic buying or some hoarding of rice and beans and other staple foods. Uh, but we have uh, enough production here in the United States to more than support our population. And as has been indicated earlier in the program, um, as it relates to rice, uh, about 50% of the rice uh, produced in the United States is exported. I'm also happy to say that during the onset of the pandemic, many existing export contracts were in place and uh, for U.S. rice. And United States rice exporters were able to successfully execute uh, on all of their contracts. And despite uh, a lot of buying domestically in the United States, um, all of the export contracts were honored and executed. 好谢谢谢谢呃克里斯先生那接下来呢还有一个问题我们要问一下克里斯先生呃是这样呃有一家企业说我们是烘焙食品的工厂呃想问一下有没有美国大米的延伸产品比如说是米碎啊或者说米
。好，我们接下来我们还有一个问题啊，这个也是问的非常那个，对于进口商来说问的非常具有实际意义啊。这个问题呢是这样子的：目前每年中国进口美国大米的配额是多少吨？啊，生意如何触达到企业和用户？那么这个问题呢，我们请呃中国市场顾问陈耀俊先生来做一些解答。哎，你好，呃，非常感谢，呃，非常感谢这个问题。那么呃 ，OK， 呃，非常感谢这个问题。其实，在中国进口大米的配额里面，呃。那个总量从所有供应国家加起来是五百三十二万吨，五百三十二万吨，但是在这个五百三十二万吨里面，并没有任何的呃单一国家的配额，就是所有的供应的呃国家都要在呃配额里面竞争进口，希望能够呃达到中国。消费者的那个需求跟满意，所以直接的答答案就是，呃，美国跟其他的国家都是一样，没有一个呃个别个国家呃呃的呃进口大米的配额。谢谢你的问题。好，谢谢陈先生。呃，那接下来呢，我们有一个问题，看来是要问一下，呃。那个 Bobby Rich 先生，或者是 Joshua Robinson 博士的，呃，问题是这样子的：我们现在有计划小量进口一些美国稻米到国内来，但是呢，有点担心，呃，会有一些原因导致清关受阻。呃，想如想问一下，如果是如果出现这样的问题，我们应该怎么样来解决呢？Thank you. Uh, one of the jobs of my office and my colleagues, both at the uh, at the Foreign Agricultural Service and at the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, is to help answer those questions when they arise. So, uh, if if there were to be issues with customs clearance, uh, my offices in Guangzhou, Shanghai, Beijing, and in Shenyang, as well as all of the offices and uh, interests. Of the U.S. Department of Agriculture would be there to help you address them, and we would work closely with our colleagues at the USA Rice Federation to ensure that any issues that arise would be、uh, addressed appropriately. Good. Thank you, Bobby Rich 先生的回答。那么最后呢，我们现在有一个问题，重分量很大啊，也是大家非常想知道的：美国稻米什么时候可以进入中国？那么这个问题呢，我们请美国稻米协会亚洲市场总监 Jim Green 先生来回答。Thank you. That's a that's a good question. We know that there has been considerable interest on the part of rice importers in China in U.S. rice. We know they have entered into negotiations with U.S. rice suppliers, and we expect that there will be some、uh, purchases in the very near future. And you can see U.S. rice arriving in China again in the very near future. Ah, thank you, Jim. 先生，那么呢，现在还有一个问题啊，那个我们的听众们参与非常踊跃，就是呃，这个问题可能呃，我们就要问一下陈耀俊先生，呃，如果呃，在中国香港销售的美国大米需要申领牌照吗？哦，嗯，香港是一个自由港啊，它、uh, 你在香港进口。大米的话，你需你呃不需要一个呃牌牌照，但是你要跟香港政府工工商局来登记，作为一个大米的进口商啊、呃，那个是一个呃比较相对来说是一个比较简单的手续。
。好，关于在香港销售大米的问题，我们的 Chris Crutchfield 先生还有些补充。那现在请 Chris Crutchfield 讲一下。I, I don't really have anything to add, but I think you explained it very well, uh, Daniel. Um, uh, yes, there is uh, extremely active trade uh, going on between the United States and Hong Kong, and um, and uh, it's a fairly open market um, that's a, a tariff-free and uh, simply requires registration on the Hong Kong side. And some minimal documentation on the U.S. side uh, to be provided. Good, thank you. 呃，希望我们的答案您能满意。那么看来我们的时间也是非常，已经到最后非常紧张的时间。那现在是这样哈，谢谢大家踊跃参与。我们最后，我们请我们的 Chris Crutchfield 先生为我们整个会议致一下闭幕词，欢迎。Thank you, Irene. Um, many of you have uh, already met me on this webinar, or in uh, or in other places in uh, China or in the United States. But for those of you who haven't, my name is Chris Crutchfield, and I'm president and chief executive officer of American Commodity Company, also known as ACC Rice, here in California. I also chair uh, the United States Rice Federation Asia Promotion Subcommittee. And as a representative of the U.S. rice milling and exporting industry, I want to thank all of you for your participation here today. I hope you've gained very useful information about the U.S. rice crop uh, that will increase your interest in importing U.S. rice very soon. Uh, as we've discussed many times in this call from the very beginning introduction uh, from the Federation's president, Betsy Ward, all the way until the Q&A standpoint. Here in the US, we grow many different types and varieties of US rice. Uh, not just long, medium, and short grain, uh, but literally hundreds of different kinds of varieties uh, from aromatic uh, long grains to short grain glutinous varieties and everything in between, uh, wholly milled, brown, and parboiled forms. We would welcome your interest in importing any and all types and forms of these U.S. produced varieties of rice. The U.S. rice grown, crop is grown, milled, and further processed under stringent regulations for food safety and quality control. In addition, the U.S. rice industry is committed to the highest standards of environmental preservation, conservation, and sustainability. Again, we hope your interest in U.S. rice continues and bears fruit in the form of nearby exports. As an industry, we are committed to provide you with rice of the highest quality and most stringent standards for safety and food quality. We stand ready to partner with you in the future and trade rice between our two countries. Xie Xie. Uh, 呃，谢谢大家，谢谢我们热情的听众观众们，谢谢我们非常努力工作的嘉宾们。那么今天的会议，呃，非常的圆满。那么是这样子，会议之后呢，呃，我们将发送录制的视频会议给大家，大家可以再重温一下。那么也会通过邮件。请大家帮忙填写一份调查问卷，也使我们将来能更更加，呃，更好的为大家服务。那谢谢您的参与。那么今天的会议就到此结束，谢谢。Yes, our webinar today. Completes today. Thanks for all your participation.